Richard Cook is a partner at Cook Plus Fox Architects in New York, and he's the lead designer behind the Bank of America Tower in New York, which is 366 meters, 1,200 feet, 55 floors, and it's the tallest building built in New York since the World Trade Center in the early 1970s. So no pressure there. What kind of sensibilities were there uh, in, in designing this building? Well, we, we had the remarkable blessing of working with the Durst organization, second generation green building uh, builders. So they built a building called Four Times Square, which was uh, generally acknowledged as the first green skyscraper in America. So they came to us and they said, uh, we've already done it. It was very, very successful for us. Let's see how far we can go when we design the next green skyscraper. The Bank of America is the, uh, the main tenant in the building. What were their requirements? Well, the bank and the Durst became a partner, 50-50 joint venture partner and the owner of the building. So we had this remarkable partnership that we're driving, one, to be the next green skyscraper in America, and also to be the healthiest workplace for the associates for the bank. And one of, one of the things here is, is um, kind of the building's heritage or uh, uh, the legacy that it's perpetuating. It's a crystalline form that's inspired by the legacy of the 1853 Crystal Palace, which once stood adjacent in Bryant Park and also by a quartz crystal from the client's collection. Yeah, nice combo. Um, and also the concept of biomimicry, that we hope that the building looks like a beautiful, naturally occurring form in the great metropolis. And these, this is not a new concept. Hugh Ferris, in, uh, in a painting called Night in the Science Zone, and those early zoning diagrams that Hugh Ferris did, um, really looked at the crystalline form as a beautiful kind of organic form for a skyscraper in a dense urban environment. And yes, the client had, has a, cl a crystal collection and uh, we were looking at that crystal collection at the time, and we had the benefit of directly across the street in Bryant Park being the original home for the Crystal Palace, which was uh, an all-glass building, the first all-glass building in America, a steel frame, iron frame, and glass, and they used uh, a baked enamel on the glass to improve its solar performance, which was also an inspiration for the building. Years ago, um when the skyscraper age was just starting, they had ordinances in New York about setbacks and, and building proportions. The problem being was that light couldn't reach the street. Right. And here's a, here's a very tall building where light is really kind of an integral part of everything where it lets the sun in. Right. Uh, how did you accomplish that here? Well, w we knew that um, people really feel good when they feel connected to nature. So early on, we knew that we wanted to keep that connection to nature. The easiest way for us to do it was to have very, very clear glass. So it's a low iron glass with a very high performance, low E coating. And then that still wasn't performing um, for the solar heat gain the way that we'd like. So we created a ceramic frit dot screen for the building, very dense at the lower portion of the glass and at the upper portion, then fading away to purely clear in the five foot vision zone. And the theory there was that when people are viewing, it's absolutely clear and you have this great connection to the horizon, the sunsets, the sunrise, weather systems coming and going. And then we'd improve the um, solar performance by the light reflecting off these opaque ceramic dots on the glass called ceramic frit. Um, the ceilings are a little bit higher, and the bank committed early on to do glass partitions to bounce more light deeper into the interior. And once you spend the energy to do that, it's very important to do daylight dimming also to harvest that daylight. How, how is the daylight dimming done? Well, what daylight dimming does in concept is that we have a free resource, which is the daylight coming in. And what happens in most office buildings, the lights are either on or they're off. And what daylight dimming does is dim down the lights when it reads that there's enough natural light for the work environment. So you're not having both artificial lighting and daylighting at the same time. And most statistics show about a 25% increase in uh, performance or 25% reduction in the lighting cost when uh, teamed with daylight dimming. Some of, some of the lead platinum um, items uh, here are things that we've seen in other buildings. Uh, there's some advanced technologies listed here, which include a clean burning on-site five megawatt cogeneration plant, which uh, provides approximately 65% of the building's annual electricity requirements and lowers the daytime peak demand by about 30%. And interestingly, there's a thermal storage system, 
which I always love hearing about because it's such neat technology. How is that done in this building? Well, what happens is we have this gas-fired uh, turbine on-site power generating device. And uh, that, that's designed to go pretty much all the time, 24-7. So at night, when the building has a very low load profile. What happens in an office building? We have very peaky loads. So during the day, it's very high and then very low at night. So the on-site power generation clips the load, the peak demand. And then the idea is how do you fill in the valley? So we use the cogen to actually power ice chillers in the basement to fill in the lower portion. And we freeze ice tanks at night. We have 44 10-foot diameter ice tanks and we freeze these giant ice cubes every night and then the building engineers calculate the cost of energy and the time of day and they burn, they melt that ice as basically free cooling during the day. What was the, uh, the range of options available to you when this building began because this, this whole thing started what about 2003, right? Well, first of all, you started literally, well, I mean, just a couple of years after 9-11. Right. So what kind of discussions were going on about a 1,200-foot tall building in New York well, in that time it, frame? It, it, was, uh, it was a remarkable blessing at the time um, because it was the Bank of America Tower, and it absolutely was in the context of 9-11 as we started designing in the late summer of uh, 2003. Um, the building at 2.2 million square feet could have been the tallest building in New York. And without any open discussion about it, everyone decided that that just wouldn't be appropriate at this particular time. So the building, we always knew it would be the second tallest building in New York. Um, wasn't an open conversation, but that was kind of a nice place to be. It was an interesting and strange time to be designing a new skyscraper in New York. Um, the other thing that was happening is that because the Durst had already designed one green skyscraper, which had integrated uh, photovoltaics and a fuel cell on site, they had really uh, learned a lot. And we were a second generation green skyscraper and everything, absolutely everything under the sun was open. So we explored wind, PVs, uh, anaerobic digester, double wall on the whole building. And what the process was, was actually an editing and a filtering of which of the, which of those technologies made a beautiful package and which could be argued were replicable. Um, Douglas Durst once said his biggest disappointment about four times square was that nobody copied him. So what are the technologies that actually pay back on a very short time period, around five years? And all of the technologies that we used did that. Uh, the only exception was water, and we just decided it was the right thing to do to radically attack water savings. And uh, when we did that, there was really no payback because um, there was such good reception about water conservation. At, in the end, we got a 25% cost reduction on the water, and water cost had gone up three times during the design process. So in the end, that's even a payback technology now. So the building has no PVs and no fuel cell, which were the things that got the most news in the previous skyscraper. So we had the opportunity to study everything and package a certain set of technologies that made sense in 2004. And you are collecting rainwater on this building. We are. We are collecting all of the rainwater that's technically feasible. We get about 48 inches of rain in New York. Um, and also, one of the big issues is, is that we use evaporative cooling. We use cooling towers. We evaporate water. We make them sweat. That's how we cool skyscrapers. We use a tremendous quantity of water to cool skyscrapers globally. So by collecting the rainwater, collecting condensate, um, uh, having water the journals, we're, we're saving a lot of water, but we're also collecting the rainwater and using that for cooling tower makeup and for flushing of the toilets. And I know that uh, the natural mimicry is one of your favorite things to talk about and one of your favorite aspects of this building. Uh, biophilia is one term that has come up, which is uh, described in the, uh, in the book here as uh, humans' innate need for connection to the natural environment, which uh, we haven't previously thought of when speaking in the realm of high-rise buildings, particularly in a city like New York or Chicago. Uh, explain more about biophilia and what that is. Sure. Well, my definition is people feel good when they feel connected to nature. Um, people have a remarkably consistent pattern of their favorite places. If you, if you think about walking around cubicles and you look at people's calendars that they have hanging on the wall, they're almost always uh, a view of a natural landscape with water in the foreground. The Hudson River paintings, 
from an elevated position, looking out over water, a kind of rolling hill. And um, the, the biophilia is related to something called uh, the Savannah Hypothesis and Prospect and Refuge. And uh, what that talks about is that we have uh, an innate uh, feeling about where we feel safe and where, and those positions typically are with the overhead covered, with behind us a known thing, up elevated and prospecting out on the horizon. And the reason they call it the savanna hypothesis is, is picture early humans living, looking out over the savanna, up in an elevated position, make sure nothing can ta attack you from above or behind, and you're prospecting. So that the cave is refuge, and you're prospecting out on the horizon for weather systems, for prey, and for your enemies. So I think this is still part of who we are. So where are conditions of prospect and, and refuge? A, a front porch, is, I think, is an area of prospect. Your home is behind you. Your overhead's covered. You're up, elevated a little bit. You're looking out on the horizon. Urban, and uh, a front stoop. So how could we develop a building that gave that sense of prospect and, and refuge? So um, a lot of what we were talking about at the time was this connection to nature. And how do you feel safe in a building at the same time, have the ability to prospect out on the horizon? I personally think we'll see much more integration of nature in the very tall building in the future. I, the, the pinnacle at, at Duxton was really interesting in Singapore. It was just in the presentation. And I think we're going to see many, many, many more projects that reconstitute the ground plane and have parks in the very tall building. People do not like to be isolated from the ground plane and from natural connections. And I think we'll see more more and more of these created natural places, as well as uh, viewing platforms out to the horizon to make sure people just feel good in these urban environments. Well, in addition to looking like uh, a biological environment, biomimicry was another term that came up where a structure mimics something that occurs in nature. But I, I thought back to uh, a super tall project that we knew about probably 10 years ago called the Bionic Tower, where a lot of the building's actual processes were modeled on Sure. natural processes. Is that sure. part of what's going on here? Yeah, there's no question. As we continue to develop technologies, nature makes uh, very high quality ceramics at low temperature with nothing more than proteins and seawater. So we, we do it with huge quantities of energy. So we're going to have to look at how nature does things. We're now looking at wind technologies and uh, wind turbine blades uh, create turbulence and they're looking at whale fins, those little bumps on a, on, a, on a whale fin that reduce turbulence and how to increase performance. Um, Janine Benyus, who coined the term biomimicry said, you know, hey, fellas, you know, nature's been doing trial and error for a couple billion years. Maybe we should be looking at it more carefully. So now with the experience of doing this building, what might the next generation of green building look like? What other kind of technologies can you bring in that perhaps you didn't have the choice to do on this one, on this project? Uh, it, it depends on how far out in the future. I think we'll, we will absolutely be looking to nature more. But imagine a building that had pigmentation that could actually change based on solar exposure so that the solar shading comes when it needs it and then goes away when you don't need it. Buildings that adapt just like just like the human eye does, opens and closes. Um, I think we'll see many more buildings that act and interact with people in different ways. We also have technologies where the buildings will sense your arrival and when you leave it will automatically shut down. Or when you're coming through the lobby it will know, oh, He's showing up, he likes it at 70 degrees, a certain relative humidity, and the building will get ready for the occupancy and be much more kind of right-sized and right-timed for the occupancy and no longer be trying to supply fresh air and, and humidity and temperature control when the occupants aren't there. Would you say that um, we, we talk a lot about a building's design and about a building's exterior, but we don't say a lot about the building interior. We've talked about some about the Bank of America Tower, but is it, how radically different is the interior from your typical office building? What, what would a person notice, uh, notice first? Well, there was a, a radical approach to indoor environmental quality and indoor air quality in particular. So right off the bat, <clears throat> we had the example that at four times square, they, 
they used 85% particulate filtration in, in the air and with huge anecdotal evidence that people loved it and noticed the difference. So we upped the ante a little bit to 95% particulate filtration and gas phase filters also in the building, providing the absolute cleanest air that's ever been provided to a workplace um, in a high rise before. In addition, uh, with underfloor air, displacement system, it comes out of the floor and it gives each person the ability to control with a swirl diffuser their own environment. Much more comfortable. Also, um, we have a system called the Air Acuity System, which monitors CO2 and a series of other ke uh, chemicals, so that just the right amount of fresh air can be uh, delivered. There's uh, there's a story I heard recently that somebody set off the uh, Air Acuity sensor by rubbing their hands with Purell hand cleaner, and it picked up that a pollutant had come into the atmosphere. So there are many things that aren't really uh, visible, but I think are relevant for designing interior space as well as not bringing poisons, carpets are filled with off-gassing poisons, our cabinetry are, are filled with urea formaldehydes which poison the indoor environment. I think um, this will just become the new standard. Who in their right minds would want to be poisoned in their indoor environment? But I think this was the most radical approach at scale to keeping the indoor environmental quality high. Uh, the spire on top of this building, um, and the only reason I bring it up is, is is because it's something that we've noticed before in the design of the Liberty Tower, uh, or Freedom Tower, sorry, uh, that I didn't know if this was becoming kind of a, a New York signature thing or not. And you say no, that because of the mass of the building, it truly needed kind of an architectural lift at the top. Um, the building's on the exact same block as uh, four times square. So from, from Times Square to 6th Avenue, from 42nd to 43rd, there's, re there's just two buildings. And uh, the top of Four Times Square has a very large radio antenna on it. And while massing the building, um, we thought that from a compositional point of view, the spire was quite important to balance the composition on the, on the whole block. Um, from the west side now, when you look at the New York Times, which has a spire, and Four Times Square, which has a spire, and now the Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park with a spire, it actually looks like a composition that had been thought about between the three of them. But Future projects, what's up next for your firm? Well, we've been trying to go upstream further, not just how do buildings um, use power, but, and not just how do buildings make power, but even going up further. Um, so we're working on uh, bringing uh, 1,000 megawatts of clean hydropower down the Hudson River to New York City. We have a biofuels project uh, making clean burning biofuel out of waste vegetable oil in Cambodia. Um, these are the things that uh, we're, we've actually become quite passionate about, maybe not literally architecture, but I think related to how we build, uh, how we build for the future. The next skyscraper, we won a competition for a skyscraper in Boston at the uh, Government Center parking garage uh, two years ago, in the, just, just before the recession. And this had an idea of elevated gardens so that everyone was close. Uh, massive green roofs that scale down to the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway. So that was the next skyscraper, the follow-up to the Bank of America Tower, but we've been in a strange holding pattern now with the current recession. So we hope that that one goes ahead. As does everyone, but thank you. Uh, congratulations on the award. Uh, the winner of the best tall building Americas is the Bank of America Tower in New York, and Richard Cook is with Cook Plus Fox Architects. Congratulations, and thanks for coming to see us. Thank you.